I don't know if you like to travel, but I love traveling. I love to go to a new place, experience some amazing food, and learn about a new culture. But one thing I find is no matter where I go in the world, if I meet Christians, they all have the same love, joy, and heart for people. I believe it's because all Christ followers have the Holy Spirit living within them. To prove this, we reached out to Christians around the world and asked them to send us cell phone videos to show how they're partnering with the Holy Spirit. Watch this. Hi, I'm Trinity and this is Andre and we're pastors at Westside Kings Church in Calgary, Alberta. This year we launched our grade four or five program and it's just been so awesome to see the spiritual maturity and growth of uh, the young kids in our church as they desire to learn more about God. We've also just launched a brand new community piece for parents and babies. We're so excited to see what God does in this community as we provide a space for parents to receive care and support. Hi, we're from Forest View Church in Oakville, Canada, and we feel called by God to go into the Aldershot region of Burlington and serve a Toonie breakfast to the community. All the money we raise goes to local charities like Food for Thought and United Way as well as that it empowers our students to become leaders in our community. Hi, we're from Pretoria, South Africa. I think that church makes us uh, see the importance of God in our lives and having that uh, relationship with the spiritual father really helps. For example, when I was going through those no problems for many methods and academics, I had my pastor quoting some scriptures from the Bible. And this helped me a lot that I could take in those scriptures. And then God did really kind thing for me. And that's how I was able to overcome the challenge. Oh, we believe that restoring the law is restoring the law in young people with really just spiritually when I was born. And using our talents in the church to grow spiritually and to praise and worship the Lord. Our youth group made goodie bags with quarters and detergent to pay for people's laundry. Also, that same day we went to a pizza place and paid for people's meals so they'd feel blessed. And earlier this year, we raised money and went on a walk to combat world hunger. One last! We, we made soup no. to raise money for Syrian refugees, and we know God wants us to help. Hello, friends. Hello, my friends on the YouTube chat and the Discord chat. My name is Duan, and I will be your live stream host for today. Are you as excited as I am that God is not limited in the ways in which he invites us to worship his community? God has gathered us from our busy schedules to come. It doesn't matter if you're watching live or if you're watching the recording. God is not limited by space or time. Once you answer his personal invitation, he is inviting you to have an encounter with him. Thanks for saying yes to his invitation to celebrate his greatness. So in the video we just watched, we heard testimonies from Christians from different parts of the world, sharing how they were partnering with the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit lives in us, we are drawn to participate in Jesus' life of worship and communion with the Father and to participate in his mission to the world. So how are we at the meeting house partnering with the Holy Spirit to participate in Jesus' mission. Well, today we're launching Peacemakers. And as, mo as most of you know, Peacemakers is an annual campaign that we run as an act of worship and service in support of peace-building efforts around the world through our partnership with the Mennonite Central Committee. This year, we're supporting indigenous and settler reconciliation efforts locally restorative justice, work in prisons, peace-building programs in sub-Saharan Africa, and humanitarian effort, humanitarian relief efforts in Iraq. Let's check out this video. Tens of thousands have been forced to flee for their lives. So it's important for us to stand up and say we acknowledge the history of the past. Thank you. 
is peace impossible? With all the conflict and violence in our world right now, it's hard to imagine peace being possible. But as the church, we are committed to pursuing peace. This year's Peacemakers campaign, we want to show the world that peace is possible. Our goal this year is to raise $150,000 for Mennonite Central Committee's peace building initiatives, both locally and globally. Projects that focus on restoring peace and promoting reconciliation in communities impacted by violence. Peacemakers is beyond raising money. It's about making a lasting commitment to nonviolence. Though it can feel really daunting, we can all take one small step. Peacemaking starts with learning the truth and then allowing that truth to motivate us into action. Learning and taking action. This action could be donating financially if you have the means to, or getting together with others you know and starting a fundraiser, or contributing to an existing fundraiser, or raising awareness for these causes. Through these collective efforts, though each one may seem small and insignificant, together they can make a big impact. Join the Peacemakers movement from May 1st to May 29th. You can take your first step at themeetinghouse.com slash peacemakers. So, is peace impossible? Well, that depends on you. possible. Okay, so as we mentioned in the video, our goal this year is to raise $150,000 by May 29th. And you can support in a few ways. You can spend time learning the truth about conflict situations where our partners are serving. You can give to the campaign. You can start a fundraiser. You can attend a fundraiser. We also have an awesome new fundraising platform for you to share join, and even start fundraisers across The Meeting House. You can do all this by visiting themeetinghouse.com slash peacemakers. This is an incredible opportunity for us to tan tangibly, tan tangibly <laughs> live out the peace ethic of Jesus. Okay, another very important way that we partner with the Holy Spirit to participate in Jesus' mission here at The Meeting House is with our giving. Regular giving is an important part of modeling our life after Jesus. So to offer your gift or to find out more, please visit themeetinghouse.com slash give. You can make a recurring gift or a one-time donation. With the help of your monetary blessings, we are able to care for others in our community and abroad. So we thank you. We thank you for your giving and your love in action. Okay, talking about love in action, after musical worship, we'll be hearing from the overseers as we celebrate Carmen and Matt, commissioning them into senior leadership. And then Carmen will be leading us in a time of teaching. Okay, so before we move on, may I give you a quick challenge? Worshiping remotely can become passive. It can easily become passive. But biblical worship is never passive. So I want to encourage you, not just to watch the worship team sing, but sing. If you're invited to engage in certain postures like standing or stretching your hands out to bless or even to receive a benediction, do it. Do everything you would do as if you were present in body. Now, you're probably gonna feel a little awkward you might even think, what's the point? No one can hear me, but in fact, many can hear you. Every time we worship the Lord Jesus Christ as a gathered community here on earth, we unite with all the saints in glory as they do the same. So go ahead, sing, pray, and gesture, for you are not alone. Okay, friends, it's time to engage in musical worship. So dear God, be present with us as we continue to posture our hearts to worship you. Let the king of my heart be the mountain. 
fountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, is my soul. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, is my soul. Good to see everybody here today. My name is Bruce Miller. I'm here with Jennifer Hernew from the Overseers. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, we announced our new interim senior leadership team, Carmen and Matt, whom hopefully you know. And we're here today to commission them 
in the spirit of how the early church uh, brought new leaders in, into, their, into their church. And we're very thankful for Carmen and Matt, for the gifts and experience that they have, and for their willingness to take on this very challenging leadership role at this significant time in our church history. So today we want to commission them, and we want you to commission them with us. We've invited a group of people from our church family as your representatives, from the Brampton Parish, from our youth group, and from our volunteers. And uh, so we want you to join with them as we commission Matt and Carmen. We acknowledge that we are in a time of transition, but our vision and our mission has not changed. We're also in a time of discernment to see what God has planned for our church. And one of the verses that the overseers have reflected on many times is from Isaiah 43, which says, when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And then it says in a little bit later, For I am about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. And we know that God is going to do something new here at the meeting house. And together with you, we're going to discern what that is over the coming months. Transitions mean new leadership. If you think back in the Old Testament, Moses passed the baton of leadership to Joshua as they finished their wilderness experience and moved into the promised land. Elijah passed the torch of leadership to Elisha. Paul passed the torch of leadership to Timothy. And today we're passing the torch of leadership from our previous senior leadership team to Matt and Carmen. In the book of Acts, when the, in Acts chapter 6, the church was going through a time of transition. And the church met together and selected, it says, seven men who were well respected and full of the spirit and wisdom. Everyone liked this idea. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. And that's what we're going to do in just a moment, is to lay our hands on, on the Matt and Carmen. We've asked Charlie Mashenter, our executive director of the Be In Christ Church, of which we're a part, to pray over them, and also Jennifer, who's the co-chair of the board. And uh, before they do that, we'd just like to ask Carmen and Matt to say a few words. Uh, yeah, it's uh, a lot of things standing up here. One, of uh, very humbling. And one, uh, it's, it's in a, a place of privilege for us. And just wanted to share transparently from our, our seats and our hearts. Uh, it, this wasn't a, a role, I'll speak for myself, that I stepped into lightly. Um, this has been a hard and heavy season for the church. And uh, in conversation with Jesus, uh, it became evident that this was the next step for this season. And so please know uh, that my heart is... Uh, all kinds of things, excited, uh, hopeful for what Jesus has before us, and also carrying, like many of you, that continued uh, heaviness. Uh, and something that Jesus has kept saying to me over and over is like, you don't actually have to have the next six months figured out. Trust me for today. I have provision for you today. And for today, I'm asking you to be faithful to this. And so that's been just a little bit of my head and heart process with God in discerning uh, what stepping into this leadership should look like. Yeah, I, I feel very similarly. We've been aligned a lot in yeah. these early days in these last few weeks. And I'll be honest, this is a huge privilege. It's a huge honor. This has been a church community that's been my family for many years, and I love it, and us, with my whole heart. It's a huge honor to serve through this season. But it does come at a time that's important and heavy for us as well. I feel that gravity, and we want you to know that. And I feel like it comes at a season in my life when, interestingly, I'm more aware than ever of my own limitations and shortcomings and weaknesses. And isn't that the beauty of the kingdom of God, though? We hear G Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount, his first big teaching moment, here's where I'm going to be, everybody. I'm going to be hanging out with those who realize that they're at the end of themselves. 
and need me desperately. I'm going to be hanging out with the people who are mourning. I'm going to be hanging out with the people who are seeking justice, standing with those who are hurt, pursuing mercy and peace. That's where I'm going to be. That's where I'm going to be comfortable. I'm not put off by that. I'm compelled by it and drawn to it. And you're going to find me there. And how encouraging that when we're at the end of ourselves, I think we're at the front door of the kingdom. We're as close as we can possibly be to Jesus. And I wonder if that's true for our church family right now here too. We have an opportunity to be even closer to Jesus as we realize our insufficiency, our not enoughness without him. And that's the beauty of the kingdom. And if that's the kind of God we serve, then I'm in. And that's why I'm here, because this is an opportunity to be even more close to him and know him even better than we have before. And uh, we wanted to share that we're not doing this alone. Something we felt so strongly about and had a complete support from the overseers is we wanted to build a senior leadership team that equally serves along with us into leadership of this church. And so while they're not standing up here, because logistically they represent our parishes from all over and uh, part places of uh, functions within our church, we have a slide here so you can see who the leadership team is that we're actually commissioning all together today. Um, I don't need to read their names all out loud. So some of these spaces will be familiar to you, and some of them may not be. They serve in supporting function roles within our church, operations, finance, HR, communications. Pastorally, we have uh, areas represented from teaching to just pastoral shepherding to discipleship to giving leadership to what our parishes need to look like. This is actually the leadership team that we're stepping in to commissioning today, and all of the functions of our church are represented as we really say collectively we want to lean in and discern what we think that God is up to. So these are the people we're praying for today. And we've, we're new. We've hardly had a chance to get our heads around this. And yet we've had some incredible time together already. Just this past week we were together as a team to begin that prayer and discernment to say in these early days, what do we see as a forward way? There may be a picture. I don't even know if this made a slide. We tried to take a team picture via Zoom. Did it happen? There we go. This is <laughs> thanks to Eric. Shout out. He's from Ottawa. So he did not migrate down for our team team day together, but he took a lovely shot of us around the table, him in his living room, uh, but we did have a day where we just started to ask Jesus, what do you have for us? And it was an exciting day to say, we think God is saying some really clear things about what this interim season should hold for our church. There is hope, and there is a way forward. There may have been some chair races there also were that happened that day races, too, but we're yes. not supposed to talk about that. We I did don't win, race in chairs. for the you record. You may have won, yeah. but it yeah. was under dispute, I'll just say that. <laughs> And yeah, we, we want to acknowledge too that we as a family are seeking clarity right now. It's okay to name that. And we are working on developing some plans to deliver on the things that the overseers have asked us to do. And that includes things like rebuilding trust, mm -hmm. healing as a community, caring for one another well intentionally. It also includes things like discerning what it means to support and resource our parishes through this next season, looking at our finances, the whole, the whole shebang as it were. So we want you to know that we're working on those things and we look to provide more clarity to the church in the coming future. And we also want to acknowledge that there are still investigations ongoing as well, and we're liaising with the overseers as they take a lead on, on that with us. Thank you. Thank you. I invite you all to stand, if you would, please, and uh, invite you to extend your hand of blessing upon Carmen and Matt as Charlie and then Jennifer pray over them. So uh, please join us together. This is a family commissioning of our, of our new leaders. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Oh, Lord, how we give you thanks today for both Matt and for Carmen, for their willingness to answer the call of the church to lead into this season of transition at the meeting house. I think of uh, that advice that you gave to Joshua when he was about uh, to lead the people of Israel into a new opportunity. And you told him to be strong and courageous. And so we would pray that for Matt and Carmen today. Uh, and Joshua reminded them that they'd not been this way before. And that's always true of our lives. And so we just need you and your Holy Spirit to lead us forward. And Matt and Carmen need that. Lord, I pray today as we pause that you would pour out your blessing upon them. Not only them, but their families and those who surround them. And also upon the meeting house in every neighborhood, every community, every leader, every person that's impacted by the ministry of this congregation, this church, these local parishes, I pray, Lord, your blessing in this new day. We pray for Matt and Carmen that you would give them your wisdom, your protection, good health, discernment in their decisions, and a walk with you that would refresh them 
and overflow into the lives of others. Protect them, Lord, and watch over them. Help them to know when to say yes and when to say no. Remind them that uh, we're praying for them and remind us to pray for them and remind us uh, to practice the discipline of encouragement. Lord, we have realized again how weak we are and how when we go in our own strength, we really do go alone. And when we embrace our weakness and lean into you and lean into each other, there is power and there is strength and your glory can be revealed. Mm -hmm. And now we offer this simple prayer for Matt and Carmen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. Dear God, I thank you for Matt and Carmen. I thank you for their willingness to step into um, difficult leadership in a difficult season, Lord. I thank you for their obedience and their humility. I thank you for the gifting that you've given them and the hearts that they have for you. And Lord, I pray first for protection over them. God, give them special protection. Protect their marriages. Protect their families. Protect their hearts and minds, Lord. Give them courage. Give them courage to make difficult decisions, to be willing to be misunderstood, to be willing to be humble, to be willing to listen and learn and lead well, Lord. I thank you for the good plans that you have for them and for this church. And Lord, we, we surrender our own ideas and plans and ask that you be glorified in our church, whatever that looks like. I pray that you keep their hearts sensitive to you. And I thank you that they're already aware of how much they need to depend on you. The challenges that we face today and going forward are bigger than any of us, God, but not bigger than you. I pray that you keep them close, you keep them connected to the vine, drawing on your strength, Lord. And I pray the blessing of community around them, Lord. Convict our hearts to support and to be a part of the healing and reconciliation and um, the grieving and the healing as we move forward, Lord. Bind us together and bring us all forward to be a church that loves each other and loves you, Lord. So I just pray this blessing on Matt and Carmen as they go from here. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you, guys. Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus. We can imagine a hometown congregation filled with all the characters of the village, rich and poor, seen and blind, oppressed and oppressor, and wonder what this liberation looked like for them. Did they anticipate the good news would come first to the poor, the prisoner, and the oppressed? Or did they think it would come first to those with inside connections, the rich and the religious? Ruth Ann Reese. Yet perhaps what Jesus has already said will provoke a strong response among many who hear these words today. Good news to the poor and the year of the Lord's favor sound great until we get into the nitty gritty of what that means. 
The idea of a radical redistribution of property and wealth, for example, will not sound like good news to many of us who live comfortable lives and do not want to give up what we have. Still, Jesus proclaims that today, this scripture is fulfilled in him. Projecting this vision into a distant future is no longer possible. Elizabeth Johnson. True peace does not exist until there is justice, restoration, forgiveness. Peacemaking doesn't mean passivity. It is the act of interrupting injustice without mirroring injustice. The act of disarming evil without destroying the evildoer. The act of finding a third way that is neither fight nor flight, but the careful, arduous pursuit of reconciliation and justice. Shane Claiborne. When God wants to sort out the world, as the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount make clear, he doesn't send in the tanks. He sends in the meek, the broken, the justice hungry, the peacemakers, the pure hearted. N.T. Wright. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus. Sometimes I sort of just want to let the quotes preach and say, that's good enough, is it not? Uh, but here we are. Welcome to the beginning of our Peacemaker series, Peace Be With You. And you would have heard, whether you're engaging with our live stream or across our parishes, that we are launching our Peacemakers campaign for the month of May. And this, honestly, guys, is like... This to me is our sweet spot as a church. If you've been around the Meeting House for any length of time, you know that this is something that we do every year, and I think it's where we shine, not for our own glory, but because we are just living out of that sweet spot of saying this is what God has called us to do and to be in acting with generosity and with a posture of learning and supporting fantastic organizations that are on the ground doing peacemaking work locally and globally. So just even like the launch of peacemakers, like welcome to our sweet spot. And my encouragement to all of us is to engage with that. Uh, learn more about it if you're like, I'm new here, I don't know what this is, or if this is like year 10 or 12 of this for you, it's looked different over the years lean into what that looks like to say this is a, the best expression of us as the meeting house with our peacemaker campaign but then also this is our sweet spot as followers of Jesus learning and understanding and engaging with what it means to be a peacemaker is at the core of who we are when we say we want to follow Jesus and be like him so this teaching series is also pretty exciting for me because it allows us to like lean into that a little bit more you can see here it's also in your notes where we're headed over the next few weeks uh, this series is titled peace be with you which are words of Jesus that he gave to his disciples and we want to kind of dissect that week in and week out and see where we are so we're on week one and we're talking about peace, which, I mean, let's be fair. They said, Carmen, your topic is peace. And I'm like, okay, just like a small slice of the pie, I suppose. But um, we're going to talk about the theology of peace. If we're leaning in as peacemakers, as a community, it's a good to have an understanding of, of what this means. And so that's where we're headed today in a short amount of time. I know our commissioning uh, was a significant portion of our morning and want to say thank you again. This is a unique space to stand, but thank you. And so with the remaining of our time, let's talk a little bit about peace. If you have your Bibles or your phone, we're going to be landing mostly in Luke chapter 4, which puts us kind of at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And I think this is actually really core to this concept of what does it mean to be a peacemaker? Where do we get the concept of peace from? So Luke chapter 4, I want to kind of paint the picture of where we're headed as we look at the words of Jesus and the actions of Jesus in Luke chapter 4. And we're going to... Um, kind of verse 14. So the first part of Luke 4, Jesus is in the desert, and he's uh, being anointed by the Spirit, and he's engaging uh, with, the, with, with Satan, and he comes out of that time and launches into his, the ministry component of his life, and he's been traveling and teaching and healing, and then we find ourselves kind of at verse 14, where we want to start things. And so before we read it, I want to just paint a picture of the cultural tone of the time where Jesus was walking into. Rome was the occupying state at the time. And we're not here to do a history lesson, but this is important information because the Israelites were an oppressed nation. 
They were, they were living under uh, Rome occupancy. Caesar Augustus was the ruler at the time. And if you do any, any surface digging even of Augustus and his rule, uh, you may know the term Pax Romana. I don't know if that's a term that you know or have heard, but that essentially meant Roman peace. And one of the things that Caesar Augustus was known for during his rule was that things were actually quite peaceful. This was a peaceful time, but if we dig a little deeper, what we learn is that it was a peacekeeping sort of peace. Culturally, there were uh, societal statuses of, you know, you have the citizens, you have the upper echelon, and you have soldiers everywhere. You have soldiers that are pervasive. There's a heavy taxation, making sure then that societal order and structure stay in place based on who pays what taxes and what it means for the rich getting richer and the poor staying poorer. And while you have peace, you don't have to dig too far to realize that it was a peace that came out of military exhaustion. It was a forceful peace. So yeah, while the history books talk about Pax Romana and a, a context and a culture of peace, it was a peacekeeping that was in space because of the military presence of the time. And so this is what Jesus is walking into as he starts with his ministry. And he comes along with a very different model of what it means to have peace. Jesus, as he starts, we'll see in Luke 4, is about to take this from peacekeeping to peacemaking. And that's so significant. And so uh, let's read uh, Luke chapter 4 together. Well, I'm supposed to look on this side. So uh, <laughs> Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 21. He went to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went to the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And so there are a few things to note. We're going to kind of dissect this, but there are three things that Jesus does that instantly indicate that he came for a different way. So him heading to the synagogue, this would have been relatively normative, and you may have caught in the passage that the scroll was handed to him. This was a normative practice, that there was almost like a regular reading that would have been presented at the synagogue. So Jesus didn't choose this passage. It was handed to him, and he was reading um, from the, the regular rhythm of the reading that would have taken place in the synagogue. And here are the three things that Jesus does, and then we'll talk about them. Uh, he sits down. First and foremost, he sits down. Actually, we're going to talk about them right now. We're not going to do all three. He sits down. And the reason why this is significant is because the minute he sat down, he indicated to them, and I'm here to teach you. Whereas normally, the reading in the synagogue was simply that, a reading. But then he sat, and that would have uh, indicated he wants, he's going to preach. <laughs> he's going to preach. And where he sat was also really significant because the place that he sat was reserved for the Messiah. So right off the top, Jesus is saying, I'm here to teach you a new way, and this way is about me. So the first thing he does is he sits down. The second thing he does, he does is he omits a line from the passage that he's reading. Uh, he's reading from Isaiah 61, and what he doesn't read is the line. If you were to flip back in your Bible to Isaiah 61, you would have noticed some differences in what he said, and this line comes from Isaiah 61, verse 2, where it says, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, which he reads, and the day of vengeance of our God. And Jesus, very much on purpose, doesn't say that line and there's a reason for that, because when they're talking about the day of vengeance, that's yet to come with Jesus' second coming. That's a prophecy that has yet to happen. And what Jesus is saying is what has been prophesied, what I'm about to see, say to you now, is all about this good stuff of freedom and release and taking care of the poor. And it would have, it would have caught the listener's ear 
that that line was missing, and that was very much on purpose. So Jesus sits down, he leaves out the line, and then the third thing he does is the thing he says at the end. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He's, he's indicating for the, the listeners at the time that this is no longer a future forward, end of day prophecy. This is me and this is now. And so as we talk about following the way of Jesus and as we talk about peacemaking, you might say, well, so what does this have to do with peacemaking? Because peace is at the core of the way of Jesus and he, he gives so much nod to that through this Luke passage and there's so much significance here. Jesus came to say, you may be keeping the peace, but I'm here to make it, so listen up. And so I want us to look at a few of the segments within Luke 4 to say, what was the way of Jesus that helps us understand a theology of peace and a way forward for us as people who follow him as we step into owning our call and our identity as peacemakers? So the first thing that this passage indicates that Jesus came to do was to bring about societal change, change and shift. And you can see in verse 18, he talks about he came to proclaim good news to the poor. So when Jesus said, like, these words are fulfilled right now in your hearing, he made it clear that this wasn't meant to be like some flighty, near the end of times thing. This was a call for the people right then and right now to start doing the words that Jesus said, to bring transformation into the societal structure, to say this isn't something that we can no longer be held accountable for, that right now, this is the the present um, bringing of the hope and renewal that Isaiah actually talked about. And if you go on to look at the life of Jesus' ministry, and then even when he leaves and the life of the church, this became a key identifier for people who followed Jesus and the expression of the church, that the societal structure was going to be different than the way of Roman oppression and the way of Jewish Jewish law. And so part of what Jesus invites us to is a way of peacemaking that says, There is good news for everyone. And in this passage, he talks about the poor, but what he's indicating here is that societal structures no longer are the rule of the day. What we need to look at is a way that brings good news to all people. So societal structure was one of the things we see that Jesus is modeling in this passage. The second one is just a dismantling or a restructuring of power. He talks about freedom for the prisoners, setting the oppressed free. Jesus didn't come to be about the empire. Jesus had no use for the empire except to dismantle it and show a new way forward. Uh, The Jewish people would have been living under empirical rule for so long, and Jesus, in everything that he did and said, pressed against the way of the empire. Jesus, he didn't just speak with his his mouth. His verbal proclamation was accompanied by works of healing. And this drew for him great um, acclamation and a following But what it also did is it brought about uh, a rise of anger and uh, opposition to his way. And if you're in home church, you're actually going to see this. You don't actually have to go much farther than what we read today to see how quickly the people turned against him. And it's because people started to realize that, wait a minute, maybe what Jesus is saying here, uh, he means it for all people. It's not just for people that fit within our power structure. It's actually maybe for even our enemies, this idea of freedom and release. And that didn't sit well with a lot of people. And you can see, you can see the parallel narrative of Jesus' life and ministry and the growing angst toward him, which ultimately culminated in his crucifixion. But it's because Jesus was bumping up against systems of power. And let's be honest, back then in first century uh, Roman rule, or today, we find comfort in systems of power that tend to benefit us. And so Jesus is coming to challenge that. And the final thing is he talks about the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus is pointing to this year of Jubilee. Now that may be a term that you're familiar with or you're not familiar with. This was a tradition, a Jewish tradition in their law where every 50 years, it was a year of release. It was a year of forgiving debts and for turning over land and for uh, releasing slaves. 
And you can see this description here, the Jubilee year occurring after every seventh Sabbath year, thus every 50 years, is an economic, cultural, environmental, and communal reset when the land and the people rest. And all those who are in slavery are set free to return to their communities. If this isn't at the core of peacemaking, I don't know what is. This is Jesus saying, this used to come every 50 years, and now this is the year of the Lord's favor. This is what I want for all people. And this is the blueprint. This idea of the year of Jubilee is the blueprint for peacemaking. Practicing Jubilee makes peace. Think about that concept for a minute. Think about the places that we have conflict in our world, in our local communities, and maybe even in our own lives. And then think about the principles of Jubilee, forgiveness, generosity, sharing. And think about stepping into those practices, what that would do to bring peace. Now you might be sitting there thinking, that's lovely, Carmen, that's a beautiful idea, that would make a fantastic poster in my office. But let's not go, like, there might be a caution to think if we really did that, things might go crazy. Like, we need some sort of structure and order. Like, whoa, 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 let's like slow the roll here a little bit. And I, the reason you may not be thinking that, I was thinking that even as I was prepping my message, I was like, whoa, we can't take this too far. And I was actually like convicted in the moment of this sense of like, but why not? Why not? As a, as a culture, as Western society, as humans in 2022, we aren't, I don't think, in danger of being too much of those things yet. When we get there, then maybe we can have a family meeting and talk about, like, guys, we're being too generous and too forgiving and we're releasing too much. I'm, I promise you, we can have that conversation if we ever get there, but as humans, we actually have a propensity to lean into structure and order and the structure and order that serves us best. And so my call that I think Jesus is, in, is modeling for us is to say peacemaking is embodying the year of Jubilee, release, freedom, forgiveness, generosity. And if you're like me, maybe that's something, that little like catch in your heart you want to bring to Jesus this week to say, I believe it and I get it, however, I'm nervous about this or this. And let's process this with wisdom and discernment, and let the way of Jesus lead us. So to recap, this is what Jesus came for. Societal change, confronting powers, and this modeling of Jubilee. This is what we see as he preaches uh, Isaiah in Luke 4. So what does this mean for us today? You can see, I tried to like, this is not an exhaustive list, and maybe you could come up with different parallels that you would find, but I think about for us as the meeting house, as followers of Jesus, or maybe as people who say, I don't actually follow Jesus yet, I'm investigating. These, I think, are the invitations that Jesus is modeling for us. This is our blueprint for peacemaking breaking cultural norms and looking to the margins and practicing the principles of Jubilee. We may not, so breaking cultural norms, we may not have the same cultural rigidity as they did in first century Rome, but, but what norms do we have that prevent peace from happening? Are there stigma? Is there privilege? Do we need to learn beyond our own current context? What does it mean when you hear that part of peacemaking is understanding your cultural norms and pushing past that to maybe affect societal change? Uh, Looking to the margins. As we talk about Jesus dismantling power, I think what that means for us today is to more often look to the margins. And let's name, we all have different margins because we're all standing in a different space. It's not about this is the one identified margin over here, but the question I have for us to hold as we talk about peacemaking is uh, how often uh, do you intersect with the potential margins that surround your world, whatever your context might be? I think that is an active decision we need to make to say, where am I and where's my, where is my view often? And then who's not in it? Because so often the people who aren't in it are the ones experiencing conflict and unrest and oppression and a power uh, dysfunction 
And we have a role to play as we follow the way of Jesus to look there. He so often looked there. And yeah, it, it riled people up. But Jesus didn't come to continue to prop up an empire. And then practicing jubilee, practicing generosity, sharing and forgiveness. This is what the Jesus movement is all about. It's living through, like though as every day was jubilee. And I actually think we have an opportunity through our peacemaking campaign to practice jubilee, to practice this generosity, this forgiveness, this idea of sharing. And our peacemaker campaign, of course, is inviting us as a church to get creative with financial resourcing and support, but also the call for us in this uh, peacemaking campaign is for us to learn and take action. So yeah, while we're hoping across our parishes that people do creative fundraisers and that we collectively, we can do so much more together than we can individually, can't we? I'm excited to see what impact we can make financially with our generosity, but also use this month, use this Peacemaker campaign to do this call to learn and then take action. And we'll all have different things that we maybe need to learn. Maybe we need to learn how to look to the margins. Maybe we need to learn what stigmas or privilege we live out of. Maybe we just need to learn about how to reorient pieces of our lives so that we can be radically generous and release with forgiveness and step into spaces where we can bring peace. And so while we pull this back together as we close around our peacemaking campaign, you can see the website here. This is where your resourcing is gonna come from this month. Our church, our Compassion staff do a fantastic job of resourcing us well in this season. And I am excited for us. I, agree, I, I said it at the beginning, but I think it's true. This is our sweet spot. Jesus has modeled this way for us. And now we've almost been handed as a church, like, therefore, let's help you live this out through our peacemaking campaign. Um, okay, as we close it's always good to just close with the words of Jesus, isn't it? We started with the words of Jesus. Jesus didn't just talk about peacemaking in Luke 4, near the beginning of his ministry. His life modeled that way. And then um, in his Sermon on the Mount, which perhaps maybe are some, most, some of his most famous words, and sort of the way that he says, if you're going to follow me, let me lay it all out for you. And one of the things he says is, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. He says that because he wants to invite us into a place where we will experience fulfillment and blessing. And that maybe looks different than what we would anticipate it would. But he says, this is who I am and this is how I came to live out a way that was different than the empire that we're currently living in. And I would say the same is true of us today. We're living in an empire. It's not Roman oppression. but we live in an empirical society. And Jesus says, there's a different way forward and my call to you is to be a peacemaker. And so um, there's, I want you to reflect on these images along with the words of Jesus. I don't have much to preach on it. These have captivated me. Maybe you have seen these too. The, these come from uh, the, you can head to Instagram, salt and gold collection. And this is just a smattering. They, she has a foot washing series. And to me, they just uh, embody the posture that Jesus so often took. So as we close, I just want a minute of pause and then I'll pray to just absorb this. Some of us are visual learners and maybe this hits you more than any of my words have. And then let's close together. Jesus, we know that you came to model a different way. And my prayer, God, is as we look to the beginning of your ministry that you were filled with the Spirit. Uh, And that is what allowed you to move and speak and be uh, the human presence of God and model a different way. My prayer for us is that we also will come to a fulfillment of the Spirit, a filling that allows us to live in a way that so often presses against cultural norms, the power structures that have been afforded to us in places of privilege, whatever our starting assumptions are. God, teach us on a deeper level what it means to be makers of peace in a world that has a different uh, standard of keeping peace. 
And Jesus, as we step into five weeks together as a church in our peacemaker campaign, would you uh, draw us so close in unity as a church? May this actually be a sweet spot. May we be known as followers of you that live out your love through making peace. And may we play our part, help us to repent of the things where we hold too tightly to our own comforts and ways of being when you have called us to press against things. May our collective efforts uh, make an impact in our world, not for our own glory or benefit because we are simply responding in obedience to what you have asked us to do. And by your spirit, meet us where each of our hearts is at to understand more about where we need to shift to embrace a life life of making peace. We pray this in your name. Amen. Generosity, forgiveness, and sharing. The sign of a worshiping heart is the active Jesus follower. So how is the Holy Spirit asking us to live out generosity, forgiveness, and sharing in our lives today? Earlier earlier I spoke about how God has gathered us to have a divine encounter with him. But he also desires for us to have human encounters as we work together to live out the mission of Christ. At the Meeting House, we have some home churches in person and online where you have the opportunity to share how the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart. What resonated with you today? Share the ways that God through Christ was made known to you today, either through a prayer, in the text of a song, or in the message. Share your God encounters. And maybe this week, find ways as a community to be generous, forgiving, and sharing with our families and in the world. Also, if you have any questions for us as a church in regards to anything, anything that was shared today, please feel free to contact us at ask at the meetinghouse.com. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you, and I will see you soon.